Ahmed, are you ready? Shall I start the session? <coughs> yes, yes, Ashwini, I'm ready. For sure. Um, welcome back again uh, to all the participants and the resistance and uh, I'm sure you all have very, in, uh, you have listened to all the interesting presentations and they are insightful. Uh, the next topic for today's, in this today's agenda is a panel discussion and on the topic of roadmap to resilient supply chains in the post COVID-19 era. This session is moderated by uh, Associate Professor Ahmad Abarshi. Ahmad Abarshi is, uh, is an Associate Professor in the Supply Chain Discipline at the School of Accounting, Information Systems and Supply Chain. Uh, Ahmad have, uh, Professor Ahmad have been publishing very active in research and he have been published in a, in a wide area such as operations management, transportation and green supply chains. And his work and has, has appeared in a lot of leading journals in uh, both in uh, logistics and supply chain discipline and also information systems. The, to name just few of journals, it could it, uh, there are transportation research part A, part D and part T, computers and industrial engineering, information technology and people, international journal of logistics research and applications, journal of computer information systems, and there are so many other journals as well to these are just to name few so uh, i would uh, i would invite uh, associate uh, professor abarshi to moderate this session uh, thank you abarshi uh, thank you very much ashwini uh, woman jika uh, for those of you who might not know the meaning of woman jika in victorian aboriginal language woman jika means welcome so welcome uh, to our last session in our today conference. As Dr. Ashwini said, I'm Ahmad Abarashi. I'm the moderator for our today industry panel discussion. A uh, few uh, minor things for housekeeping. Uh, I would appreciate if you can uh, put your microphone on mute and uh, turn off your webcam during the uh, session. But obviously you have uh, the opportunity to ask uh, questions or uh, share your comments. Uh, to do so, you can use the chat box and uh, simply post your question or your comments uh, on the chat box. Or alternatively, you can raise your hand and in appropriate time, you will be given the opportunity to ask your question or share your comments. Um, as said before, uh, the focus of our uh, <coughs> panel discussion is a roadmap to resilient supply chain in post COVID-19 era. If you uh, use any academic database and just uh, search uh, some uh, publications in the area of supply chain resilience, you will find many, many research in that domain. Um, researchers look at uh, supply chain resilience in um, different aspects of the supply chain resilience. But if you look at uh, these uh, publications a bit closer, you see the significant volume of the research or in fact, conceptual in nature. And a couple of literature uh, review on uh, supply chain uh, resilience also show the same fact that we need more uh, empirical research. So in order to uh, do more empirical research, obviously the first thing is to uh, listen to the industry and see uh, what problems they have and how they look at the problems and how they deal with the problems and uh, in fact, what they have done to mitigate these problems such as, you know, pandemic. So I believe this uh, opportunity, I mean, industry, industry panel discussion provide great opportunity for both sides, I mean, uh, academia and that we are facing. Uh, having said that, uh, we are quite for, uh, fortunate to have a wonderful uh, panelists from industry for uh, this session, and it's my privilege to introduce them to you. Uh, from left to right, the first uh, panelist is Dr. Amir Hashemi. Uh, Amir has more than 15 years of experience across a wide range of uh, industry sectors, from manufacturing to uh, fast-moving uh, consumer goods, and serving uh, in various uh, leadership roles and leading different projects on various topics such as uh, supply chain transformation and supply chain optimization. Uh, Amir got uh, his PhD from RMIT uh, in logistic and supply chain management, in fact from our department, uh, with a focus on uh, supply chain complexity. 
Uh, prior to joining uh, industry, uh, Amir worked as uh, academic and still is uh, helping us in uh, different courses that we have in our department in different roles, such as, you know, uh, guest lecturer or industry speakers. Amir is currently the supply chain director at Aurora Beverage Camp. Our second panelist is uh, Mr. Michael Cope. Michael has more than 20 years of experience in Australia Post in various uh, capacities from uh, leading senior marketing and strategy teams to uh, working in international services in Australia Post. Uh, Michael also has uh, extensive executive roles in some leading Australian uh, companies such as uh, Cricket Australia and Lion Nathan Brewing. Uh, currently, Michael is uh, the General Manager, International Services at Australia Post, uh, overseeing Australia's relationship and commercial arrangement with 192 countries, as well as leading the Australia Post UPU delegation in Switzerland. Uh, Michael is also the Chairman <coughs> of the Kahala Postal Group, or KPG, which is an international alliance of the postal administrations of 11 countries, including mm -hmm. Uh, Australia, um, US, UK, China, Japan and more. And finally, Michael is very competitive in road cycling. And our third uh, panelist is Mr. Anshul Bargava, same as our uh, two panelists. Uh, Anshul has ex extensive industry experience, in fact, more than uh, 15 years of experience uh, leading uh, various and complex projects on different topics such as you know operational uh, transformation, business transformation, ARP upgrading, supply chain and logistic operations, setting up global business units and many, many other uh, engineering and manufacturing projects. Anshul uh, is currently the general manager at uh, Berg Solution. Welcome to all of you. Uh, we understand that at this time of the year, you are quite busy with so many things on your plate. So we appreciate your time attending this session. Uh, so without any further delay, I would like to start the uh, discussion with the first question. So my first question, in fact, is about the impact of uh, pandemic. Uh, one of the biggest challenges in any supply chain and there are different reasons for disruption in a supply chain. Uh, it can be natural disaster or can be um, terrorism or uh, a strike and of course it can be uh, a pandemic outbreak. But when we compare these uh, causes of uh, disruption we can see that a pandemic outbreak in fact uh, in terms of the impact on supply chain is much more severe compared to other sources of disruption. So my first question, in fact, is to see what is the most uh, more powerful impact of the pandemic on your supply chain where your company belong to. So you can think about uh, if, if you have this information, which part of the supply chain, whether this impact has been on supply a part of the supply chain or demand part of the supply chain. So I'll try to rotate the question. So uh, may I start with uh, Amir for the first question? Amir, are you there? Yes, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Great. Uh, thank you for the opportunity, Dr. Varashi. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll go straight to answering. I, I think the, the way that I describe pandemic for our company in particular is almost three phases of impact. The, the first phase of impact that, that, that I would call it was the start of the pandemic. It was a big shock to our supply chain because a lot of demand crashed and many of our customers pulled full fast out. When I look at the dates, that's around March to June 2020. That was really the period that we had a significant reduction of forecast and demand and we end up with a significant amount of inventory from both finished goods and raw material perspective. Then, then I would describe a, the, the honeymoon period that I'll call from July 20 to September 20, which all of a sudden the demand completely changed for our business. We produce aluminium cans um, and, and many of the beverage companies, because of the lockdowns and the issues, their demand went through, um, through really, the demand went up and it was a honeymoon period because we had a lot of inventory and happily supplied all those products to customers and, and that was a period that uh, that was really good for the business and since October 20, which I call the, the, the pain period, 
and, and, and continues, is our supply chain being challenged through a variety of different aspects from shortage of raw material in particular. Uh, we had significant uh, issues out of Asia in particular. So we import some raw material from Korea, we import raw material from Thailand uh, and some from the US as well. So that was a period that because of a sufficient demand, the suppliers couldn't keep up with that. Immediately after that, in November, we had shipping issues that added on top. So the shipping delays that occurred and the flow and impact from there onwards in our operations and production. So we've had significant downtimes in our plants, loss of sales, the flow and impact that we had to move products across the country in an unproductive manner because we didn't have the product at the right time in the right place because the demand was quite volatile and then the shipping reliability was quite poor. So that shipping issues uh, in particular hurt our business quite a bit. <coughs> and I guess that pain period continues, right? The, the industry is, is facing with shortages on pallets and, and now more recently on ads blue, which is a fuel additive in the supply chain and could potentially put us at risk in calendar year 22. That's the short and, and summarized version of it. I'm a, supaya nggak langsung langkah ke anggotanya dia gitu loh maksud aku gitu kan nah kalau kayak gini tuh gimana sih aku menyikapinya sorry if you can please turn off your uh, microphone I would appreciate sorry Amir uh, we, we lost your voice sorry that's okay so I guess that that's really the summarized version of how it has impacted us so far uh, within the three period the, the most notable and significant impact obviously has been shipping but on top of shipping is their supply of raw material in particular out of Asia. So China has been struggling with a variety of factors from an energy perspective. And not only the shortage of mater material, but the increased cost of material that will flow through the supply chain. It might not have gone to the end consumer in Australia in particular, because I think many of the manufacturers are still absorbing the cost. But I suspect that we're going to have quite a fair bit of inflation in calendar year 22 coming across because businesses won't be able to absorb that cost that is ongoing uh, in, in the industry. And and you guys are all closer to that. And I'm sure Marco and Anshul will be able to, to shed more light, but the, the container prices has gone from $1,000 per container out of Asia now to 10, 11,000. So yeah. that's not something that is sustainable for the business to obviously absorb and, and contain. That, that's the high level summary, Amir. Oh, that's fine. Thank you very much, Amir. Uh, Michael, what about your Australia Post? Uh, thank you. And, and look, it's great to be here and have the opportunity to address uh, everybody. The, the question you ask is a, is a, is a really good one and, a, and uh, our experience is quite profound. Um, if we look at Australia Post's role in supply chain, we're effectively internet, we're national infrastructure. Um, going to every single household and business in the country. Uh, and for me and my business uh, in international, uh, the 28th of March, Qantas grounded its fleet. Um, we're an island. Uh, effectively, overnight, my supply chain stopped dead in its tracks with a zero capacity. Um, and then we multiply that by every country in the world. And the effect of uh, lockdowns and uh, the closure of borders had a significant impact on international trade. Uh, my point of reference is different uh, um, to Amir's insofar as he's a manufacturer, whereas we really are uh, into e-commerce and supporting Amazon, eBay and, and uh, business movements and obviously consumer movements. To give you some context about the impact, we, we suddenly had, um, you know, we went from, uh, I guess, about a, a 400 ton weekly lift to a 400 ton weekly backlog that compounded very quickly uh, nationally. And so our number one priority was obviously to secure aircraft. And I think what the pandemic did was it showed um, weaknesses in um, supply chain organizations like airlines that have it, that have a heavy investment uh, in fixed cost infrastructure because their ability to pivot is very very low and flexibility um, is is costly 
and uh, their low margin businesses at the end of the day. Um, so that in terms of supply, that was one impact. The other major impact that we faced into was domestically was the state lockdowns where every state had a different rule. Uh, every state had a different implementation. And for a national organisation with 30,000 employees, uh, whilst we were um, branded as essential services and given particular freedoms as a consequence in the lockdowns, um, the health uh, restrictions had massive impacts on our facilities. So if we had one employee test positive in a facility that had 500 people in it, all 500 were put into a two week um, uh, quarantine, the entire facility came to a halt. Now you times that by a thousand facilities around the country and the impacts that state legislation that wasn't um, harmonized to a federal view and policy had profound impacts on a national infrastructure. And so I think, you know, if, if we look at this from the academic perspective, the policies between federal and state government as they relate to COVID-19 and, and, and future pandemics and how health authorities manage that needs to be looked at to have a more harmonised approach. And we've done it through evolution, but that first six months of last year um, was a very difficult period of time for the organisation to maintain a national supply chain. Um, we run 450 B double trucks every night around the country crossing borders. And suddenly every driver had to be tested going each side of the border. Every driver had to have passes. The logistics to support the logistics um, to meet the state requirements alone was a massive undertaking. So that is a, a very simple uh, snapshot of some of the implications and issues that we faced. Thanks, Michael. Uh, Anshul? Uh, thanks, Amit. Um, thanks for the opportunity, first of all. And uh, I fully support uh, what uh, the other people have been talking about, the pandemic impact. And I I'll give the perspective from three different business businesses as such. So one of the business that I work for is B2B returns. So they are going back to the manufacturers, so from retail stores and all. So because it's not a very uh, time-oriented service, but the cost is of essence. So the shipping price is going up, especially on the international uh, international waters. That has ex that has impacted most of these businesses, right? Where the cost to return is actually minimal, but the supply chain has just disrupted that entire process, leading to the to the co components and all those commodity to be destroyed or landfilled. So it's actually impacted the environment in a different way. The second business that I work for is uh, a construction company which imports out of US and Europe. Now this is a time time sensitive business and a cost sensitive and it was impacted both ways because the construction was delayed timber we all know that it's not available and when they were importing timber they had issues with ports getting shut down these are domestic ports in US and Europe because of lack of staff right so there's ports getting shut down there are empty containers moving around like bl blank sailings the containers which are needed to fill, they are not available at the port, but they are in surplus in another port. So that entire construction timeline was disrupted. Now these are two B2B, right? But when we look at B2C, which is the third business where I work, the customers don't have the patience to wait when they're moving into a new house and we supply them furnishings into their new homes, right? And imagine if the supply is delayed in those homes and they're sitting without window covers, they are sitting without uh, furniture in their homes. It, it's a ma massive inconvenience to them. So I've had customers who were actually sleeping on the floor because they couldn't get their furniture on time. So the time and cost in these three different perspectives is completely different when you look at B2B and you look at B2C. And to top it all up, initially, the, the, when the uh, pandemic hit, people were expecting it to be a smaller one. But it's starting to grow, and as it grew, people's disposal power started to reduce. They, they started saving that money, and they stopped spending it. At the same time, the suppliers were increasing the cost. 
So the all the middle businesses who were working from B2B to B2C, all of a sudden they've got these massive costs to take where suppliers are increasing the cost, but the customers are not willing to spend more. So it, it, it's going to be a game changer in, in the year 2022 on how many of those businesses actually survive. They, they, they're not making enough profits and they don't have a mitigation plan ready for it. Very interesting. Thanks, uh, and Shul, yeah, exactly. This is what I'm um, to ask uh, as a second more question about the, the, the strategies that, you know, your business uh, in fact um, adopt and implement. Uh, I'm talking about specifically resilient strategies that, you know, uh, your company has adopted to uh, recover from the disruption. So um, uh, I just wonder if, uh, Michael, if you want to uh, start the second question about these uh, resilient strategies. Uh, thank you. Uh, yeah, look, re resilience is an interesting term, um, particularly in supply chain, but um, I think it's just a, another word for your ability to, to be flexible um, and, and manage cost and procurement of service at the same time. Um, in, in our instance, when it came to line, line haul capacity, airline aircraft, um, typically, we had had a single provider agreement with Qantas for our international arrangements because they had the broadest network based on their packs or their passenger flights. Now, obviously, with their grounding, we had to procure and, and understand how to operate with other airlines. And many people wouldn't realise this, but the postal world has a very, very specific set of regulations that bind it in terms of how mail moves through the border agencies, through air aviation security. And many airlines that we started to source and procure were not familiar with that. And so I think one of the things that we definitely have learned to adapt to is firstly, um, having more than one supplier. So uh, I think that was a very big lesson for us um, and uh, in very unusual circumstances. The second one was also being able to move freight um, between states to access where the capacity was. So typically, you know, you know, Melbourne, Sydney, Brisbane were the big ports um, because of, and again, this is the impact of state managing the pandemic differently. New South Wales had a much more open and flexible approach, which meant that we had more aircraft coming into Sydney. So again, for our local network, we had to adapt that supply chain to in order to enable our international freight to move up to Sydney and access flights and capacity there. So we were consolidating into a single gateway. Now that puts huge pressure on that one gateway when it's trying to consolidate for everybody. Um, and so, you know, we've we've learned to adapt around facilities, around our supply agreements with train with um with airlines, and we've also um, helped our customers understand the supply chain issues themselves and educate them on how to best present freight so that we can move it more effectively for them. And so if you can manage the freight at source within the supply chain in whatever shape it takes for that movement, you're enabling more efficiency. Uh, and at a time when you have constrained capacity, uh, it's probably more critical than ever. So I hope that answers your question. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Michael. Anshul, you want to elaborate on this? Yeah, it, unfortunately, in our case, whatever strategy we were trying to adopt didn't work, right? Because what I've learned is that relationships do matter in these kind of scenarios. So for the first business, which was more around re reverse logistics, it, it didn't see any impact apart from the cost because the relationship was more than 20 years old. So multiple shipping lines, multiple brokers, everybody stepped in. They said, okay, we've got a container. We'll lend you one this time. We'll lend you this time. So we were moving around 20,000 TEUs in a year without any impact, at least on the time, time front. We did have cost impact, but not on time. However, in the other two businesses, because we were reliant on, as Mike said, it was just one supplier, it, it became very hard. And especially with the ports closing, the timber yards closing, the suppliers shutting down their production facility due to COVID scares. It, it, it just became a disastrous uh, activity because we didn't have a second supplier. We didn't have a second shipping line. 
So it was all dependent on one and one. And it just went to zero all of a sudden. We had delays which were probably at one point. I remember there were around six months of delay on one particular product. Which we couldn't just source from anywhere else. Right, and it, it, it impacts everywhere. So in, in our case, none of it worked. And the worst, as I said before, B2C, the customers, as they started seeing that the product is getting delayed, whatever cash came into the business had to be returned. So that drained the business of whatever cash they had. So it was a cash flow impact. Thanks, Anshul. Uh, Amir? Yeah, so, so for us, I guess the, it was a variety of strategies we, we tried to develop. So from a planning perspective, one key activity that we had in force and we tried to expedite is that we, we had historically our SNOP and the IBP process, which was a monthly cycle, and we had our detailed schedule from a production perspective. Very quickly, we adopted the ITP or integrated tactical planning process because the monthly view was not really sufficient and the detailed scheduling really wasn't going uh, into uh, an, an adequate horizon to, to able to give us that visibility. So implementation of an ITP process immediately helped us a fair bit to get better visibility on the demand fluctuations from the customer perspective. That was one uh, big, big strategy that we implemented quite quickly. The other component, Going back to Marco's point around dual sourcing or triple sourcing, we had a long-standing relationship with very good, reliable suppliers, and and that goes not only in the logistics space but raw material perspective as well. And I think our business uh, became a bit, um, I, I would say, um, a bit complacent in terms of exploring and and finding other options, and and that's where we try to trigger that quite quickly, both from a raw material and logistic perspective. We had really long-standing relationship with shipping lines directly in certain lanes, and then all of a sudden they became constrained, and then going to other shipping lines and building the relationship with those lines, it was quite a difficult task, but that was another component. Um, the other key activity that we had was from a production perspective. So from a production perspective, we, we had shutdowns due to COVID as well, and that happened in the peak of our production, our demand um, earlier, this year, and we, we adopted an RIT testing, for example, in our production plants, trying to avoid bringing COVID into the plant. So, very costly exercise. It's it's quite a costly exercise to engage contractors, but we we had technically we identified two or three cases that could cost two weeks of downtime to each of those plants through that process. That that helped us uh, a lot to to walk through that uh, process. Another key activity that we adopted was, was seeking flexibility in our enterprise bargaining agreements. So from a production facility and, and building agility in the supply chain, we went back to, to our uh, partners in the production plans and negotiated shorter time frame and shorter uh, notice periods. Our historical notice periods were anywhere between three to four weeks to adjust our production uh, time frames. And we managed to bring those down to build the agility in the supply chain to respond to the volatile customer demand. So that that helped us uh, during the last few months to be able to uh, to adjust and also to avoid plant downtimes with idle labor in the plants, obviously, to operate. So those those were really the key short term strategies we adopted. But we are also looking into insourcing of some of the activities very seriously. Insourcing not only from a, a raw material perspective, but also some of the logistics operations that we have the expertise. We are taking a very hard look at what are the areas that really we can bring in house and manage that ourselves. Obviously, trying to do it at a lower cost, but but also trying to manage risk at the same time. So. Those are really the high level items that that oh. we have implemented so far. Oh, thank, thank you. I mean, it, it's very interesting because uh, it reminds me of the relatively new approaches that we teach our students, you know, specifically lean operations. As you know, in lean operations, we said we have to uh, reduce the cost and there are different strategies that we can follow. One of them is reducing the number of, you know, supplier because we are supposed to build up, you know, long term relationship and it's easier for 
uh, with working with few suppliers instead of you know so many suppliers. But what I actually hear here from Michael and also you, Amir, that you are considering you know adding you know yeah, sort of you know backup supplier in facing this kind of uh, uh, circumstances, and it shows that you know uh, lean operation is not going to work in all circumstances. And to some extent, it makes sense because uh, uh, the the principle of uh, lean operations is based on uh, uh, some assumption, and one of these assumptions is in fact the certainty of demand. And obviously, if you have demand certainty, we can think about uh, reducing the inventory level, reducing the number of supplier. But in facing these circumstances, such, such as you know pandemic, uh, which we have dramatic you know changes in the demand, so it would be very pro problematic. And you refer to a very good point, I mean, uh, which is you know um, um, reassuring you know uh, some of these uh, you know production facilities in house and instead of relying on offshoring and out, uh, outsourcing, in fact, because over time we lose these capabilities if we just rely on offshoring. This has happened in 1990 when China opened its door to international businesses to come to the mainland of China. So over time, uh, you know, uh, we lose, you know, the capabilities of production. So it's, it's very good points that you raised that uh, we can actually think about uh, uh, onshoring some of our production uh, processes in house. Uh, very. And, and the other one, Ahmed, on that point is around inventory. Going back to lean principles, the, the historical trend over the last few years has been reduced inventory, reduced inventory, and we're really operating at as really the most optimal level of inventory just in time operation. Majority of the businesses have gone the other way. That's why finding warehouse spaces and transport capacity at the moment is a challenge because everyone is trying to build inventory. And I think we're going to go through a cycle again for a few years. Every executive and CEO is, is focused at the moment on availability rather than cost as a first principle. I think we're going to get there again at some point soon. I completely agree with that. Uh, I think you're exactly right, Amir. I think we're we're going to see a period over the next two years of consolidation in supply chain management where it'll be multiple suppliers um, bringing the source of manufacture closer to the, to the market itself. And that's all about surety. Um, lean operation assumes a very stable environment and we uh, will be facing into fragile supply chains globally for the next two years easily as well as an overlay of, you know, um, geopolitical tension, which uh, adds a level of uncertainty around uh, trade barriers and tariffs, which also affects supply chain. And so I think you're right. There's a lot of CFOs and MDs right now who are saying, I'll wear the cost because it gives me certainty of business and continuity of business uh, relative to lean operations. Very good to hear, Michael. Uh, so uh, I think we can move on to the next question is about the future. And, uh, and I think somehow you address some of your plans for future. So uh, definitely it's not the last you know, pandemic. This is not the, uh, the last disruption that we experienced. And um, we expect that we have is it will be with us, you know, at least for <laughs> next few years. So uh, my third question, in fact, is uh, what are the main uh, takeaway from uh, this pandemic? that will help prepare better for future pandemics and um, move toward more resilient supply chain. Anshul, you said you the, the strategy didn't work, so you want to uh, elaborate on that or have you any comments on that? Anshul? Yeah, the biggest, biggest thing, as everybody is saying, that you can't rely on single supplier or a single supply chain. You, you have to be innovative in terms of how you plan it. Like I, I remember back in 2008 or 11 when there was a tsunami in Japan and Everybody was working on a eight megapixel camera at that time. And all of a sudden, because of the tsunami, the eight megapixel camera wasn't available anymore. So everybody jumped back to a five megapixel camera. And they had that was the time when they launched the mini model of the camera. The, the mini model of the phones. So you had a Samsung, I, I don't remember, it was S, S5 or something, and they came up with S5 mini. Rather than being repulsive or impulsive, you have to be reactive in a through and can actually create a market disruption. 
So every disruption comes with an opportunity to improve. So what I've seen in, in the businesses that I've worked that everybody was impulsive. They, they, were, they were looking at a problem and saying, okay, let's do this without realizing what would be the long-term impact of that. And that is why most of the strategies failed, right? But if you go through the right process, if you go through the right strategy and analyze what, where, how it can fail, you can probably come up with the right risk aversion strategy, which would work. And the way I saw the timber uh, market crash, a big, big reason for that was because no one predicted that a port can get shut down. No one predicted that a yard could get shut down. Everybody was reliant on just one yard. Everybody was reliant on one port. And as soon as it shut down, they were scrambling for options. They, they were trying to get trucks who could carry the logs. They were trying to look for rail containers which could carry the logs. Now, how, how do you get the log to the container? No one thought about it. There was no loading mechanism. So all of those things they were, were never planned out and which caused the entire disruption to happen. So if the people plan it out right, they go through the proper risk. It doesn't matter if you are late by a couple of weeks in the first hit, but if you get the first hit right, you'll be able to get the strategies going through right. Very good. Very good. Thanks, uh, Anshul. Amir? Yeah, for you us, know, I, I guess we, we touched on a few of those around, for example, multi-sourcing and, and, uh, and those strategies, but another key aspect was relationships for us. Staying much closer to suppliers and customers. So very, very, very quickly, obviously, we, we developed really frequent conversations with our, our suppliers and customers. And that was quite critical for us to walk through this period. And we struggled when we reflected on, especially with the suppliers and customers that we didn't necessarily have a very close relationship. Because we were servicing them and they were servicing us quite smoothly, there was not really a need to build some of those relationships at the time. But when the pandemic hit, all of a sudden, it came to a lot of relationships and who you know in the company as well. I'll give you an example, not, not, not necessarily the right company, but as an example, if you know the right person in a and your containers might be prioritized through the fact that, for example, you're a global account and you're on the priority list. So that became quite important to have those relationships with the suppliers and customers to ensure you can you can continue your supply. So that was really a key takeaway for us. Another component was a robust supply agreement with the customers and with the suppliers. Again, the complacency from a procurement side can be that Okay, we, we have had an agreement with the, with the supplier for 10 years. We barely review those contracts and they roll. But when, when you think about the force majeure situations and when items like this hit, you can get hit with a lot of issues from a service and cost perspective quite quickly. So that will be quite a focus for us for the foreseeable future to make sure that our contracts and agreements are robust enough to protect the business and customers and shareholders. So that's that's another uh, key activity for us. And yeah, and, and the other ones I, I highlighted already, but those are really the key items. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Amir. Michael? Uh, take a little bit of a big picture view, I suppose, but you know, if reflecting on your question and how we're working uh, today versus pre-pandemic, I think there's a couple of really key important pillars that we work on now. One, one is, what is the policy and government framework that, um, that underpins decisions that allow us to run our business and understand that and then apply it to your planning? Um, and then the, the second part is our people. So the safety of our people was paramount. Um, they were delivering all around Australia um, and they had to be safe. It was how did we satisfy those policy and, and health and safety requirements whilst maintaining a supply chain, uh, whilst maintaining the absolute integrity and the safety of our people. And then it's a case of planning that through. So um, part of our plan that we continue with now is we have a pandemic control team, which is a cross-functional um, uh, business team that includes risk, HR, operations, um, the, the, everybody, transport, 
and um, they meet and they look at what is the new challenge that has been set in order to keep the wheels turning, in order to keep the business operating, how do we manage um, the supply chain to keep it open and running. Um, so the, I'd say in terms of adaption, that's probably been the biggest one for us is understanding the guardrails that you're working within and then within those guardrails establish a business model that can still function um, effectively uh, within those guardrails. Yeah, so that's about it. Thanks, Michael. Uh, I got uh, um, more questions, but I, I saw a, an interesting question from Prem. So I just wonder if uh, we can uh, discuss a bit more on uh, this question. Uh, Prem asks, uh, do you think the commodity market will be driven by supply or demand uh, in the near future? And who will have the competitive advantage to control the global supply chain in terms of negotiation disruption, which will affect supply chain agility in Australia? I, I'm not sure any of you. If you want to. Um, there's about ten. There's about ten questions in one question there. So uh, let's just start. With uh, will be driven by supply or demand. Yeah, look, I, I can only give, I can only answer it based on experience. So when um, Australia went into lockdown, the whole of Australia went online and went shopping. Okay, and so at a time when our supply chain was at its worst, our volumes were the highest. So we now operate Christmas every day because there's been, um, in my view, structural change in terms of how Australians buy online. And they have now moved online in greater numbers. And as a consequence of that, a large proportion won't move back because the supply chain is adapted to be able to fulfill their needs and their, and their desire. So I think it will be consumer driven. I think it'll be driven by the offer and by, by the market itself. And um, you know, who, whoever can be most cost competitive with the best customer experience in terms of delivery end to end, in an e-commerce environment will we'll win. Um, now, I'm also just going to take this opportunity while I have the microphone. I'm going to have to duck off very quickly because it is peak season. We, we are Santa Claus. Um, and um, I will have to duck off in a few minutes. So I just, if I do drop off, please don't think I'm being rude. It's just that I do have to go. But Definitely, Michael, we understand. And I'm, I'm also conscious about the time because you're, according to the, uh, the schedule, we are supposed to close the session at 4.15. Am I Craig Ashvini? Yes, Ahmad. Yeah, yeah. So uh, having said that, uh, I think uh, we have other questions. If you can just very quickly, if a, any of you can uh, uh, elaborate on that. Uh, Vintai asks, uh, apart from uh, diversification, uh, what about the vertical integration? For example, developing your own transport logistic capability, such as having or chartering your own ship or aircraft. Some corporations have already done this for better control. Yeah, we, we've done quickly. that. Yes, please. Yeah. Oh, sorry, uh, um, I'll let the other guys, but just quickly, um, we now have five charters a week going to New Zealand. New Zealand is our biggest export lane and there isn't enough capacity. So we hire our own aircraft now um, and, uh, to fulfill our need. Mm -hmm. Thanks, and from a logistic yeah. perspective on our side is the same. So not the aircraft, obviously, we don't have as much volume, but from a transport logistics perspective, we have insourced some of our operations and we will continue to explore that and bring that in-house with the increased cost. Quickly going back to the commodity, given that we have been scarred by the commodity prices quite significantly over the last few months, I think a lot of research and work needs to be done on global reliability, in particular on China at the moment. But when you think about some of these products that we have significant shortages globally, all of a sudden when you look back and you see 50, 60, 80 percent of production is in China. So even though the demand has driven that, but there is the upper hand in the producing country. And if they're not necessarily bound by the global WTO, for example, regulations, the prices have inflated quite significantly overnight for, for the right or the wrong reasons is that it, it, it has disrupted supply chain globally quite significantly. So there's a fair bit of work to be done to establish when it's going to stabilize. Okay, thank you. I'm uh, unsure if you have any uh, comments very quick. 
comments yeah. on that? I'll agree that it will be a more consumer driven market because as we've seen with the lockdowns and all, most of our uh, construction projects all just came to a halt. Like we couldn't even go into occupied homes to service our customers. So it, it is a mix of how the government and the consumer reacts. Mm -hmm. right? The consumers have got the power, they'll start to negotiate to bring the prices down, which will eventually burn through the bottom line. And uh, yeah, it, it, it will be quite driven by, by the consumer. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anshul. I wish we had more time uh, because it's very interesting, you know, discussion we had so far. Uh, but unfortunately, as I said, we have to close the session because of the, the time limitation. So mm -hmm. uh, once again, I would like to uh, thank the panelists for a great uh, an in, uh, insight to share with us. And I hope that is not the end. So we will have you in future. Uh, so at this time, I'm going to hand over to Professor Boy Cam for uh, closing comments and closing ceremony. Uh, Professor Cam, over to you. Mm -hmm. Ashwini, we have to go another exactly. link or is the same? Yes, oh, I, I, I'll go from you. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Hamad, for a very co interesting conversation that you built up on here. And uh, thank you for the panel members uh, for your insight, insightful thoughts into how to build a roadmap into supply chain resilience. Um, now, uh, the, next, uh, the next point in our agenda is the task is the final one, which is a concluding remarks. And uh, Professor Buikam is here to offer his concluding remarks. Uh, Professor Buikam uh, is Professor at, uh, of Supply Chain Management at School of Information, Accounting, Information Systems and Supply Chain. Uh, uh, Professor Kam have published uh, a wide number of articles in several journals, uh, leading journals, which includes uh, International, uh, uh, International Journal of Production Research, International Journal of Physical Distribution Logistic Systems, and uh, Transportation Research Part E, and uh, the list continues on. And uh, Professor Kam have been have always been invited a, 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 by several people, both from industry and academics. Uh, in particular from countries like Korea itself. He have uh, attended several times in Korea and presented uh, um, at several institutions as well. Uh, so uh, here, Professor Buikam, and uh, could you please offer some concluding remarks? Uh, thank you, Ashwini. Uh, are you able to see my screen? Is my screen on, Ashwini? Yes, we, yes, we, we can see the screen. Oh, OK, thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ashwini, for your very kind words. I'm not sure I deserve all those accolades. And um, good afternoon to all participants, speakers, moderators, and everybody else. I'm not sure why I have to be given 15 minutes for these concluding remarks to start with, uh, with all those interesting conversations, very engaging discussions that have been going on. And I think they deserve more time and space than I do in delivering these concluding remarks. Because as far as I understand it, a concluding remark is only about five to 10 minutes. So I would definitely think that uh, the speakers and the panelists deserve more time to provide their insights and wisdoms. But nonetheless, given this job, I'm happy to <clears throat> bring this uh, very, very <clears throat> engaging event to a close. So to start, to start, what I would like to very quickly say is uh, this particular conference, Australian Korean Conference on Supply Chain Resilience, is one of the four major outcomes. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> it's one of the four major outcomes that the projects have planned, as you can see on my slides here. It starts off with an inaugural symposium that was held last year, if my uh, what do you call figures is correct. And there's supposed to be a design of the Austrian Korean supply chain resilience website. And as far as I understand it, that is still under constructions. And the third outcome <clears throat> replaces 
uh, event that was actually planned during the proposal stage, which is the staff student exchange programs between RMIT and Busan National University. But unfortunately, because of the restricted travel and also the border closed downs, that has been replaced by an RMIT PNU staff student exchange research web banner that was held last month. And today's event, today events again is a replacement of the Australian Korean Supply Chain Resilience Conference that was in Korea. And it will be a nice opportunity for all of us to visit the city of Busan. But unfortunately, because of COVID, that can't be done. But nonetheless, this replacement of active, this series of replacement activities denote or reflect the kind of resilience this organizing committee has been able to quickly shift gears, right? Just like the pra in practice, how because of the COVID, because of the disruptions to the supply chain, all these international operators have been able to so-called seek alternative avenues, improvise and innovate to deliver the very important things that consumers expect us to do from the perspective of supply chain operations. So with that, I would like to say that this has been a very, very productive journey from the, uh, from the, for the organizers and for all the speakers, panelists and participants. Because this team, this team has delivered what it actually aims to do in many sense of the word. The central theme of resilience is fully reflected and truly reflected in the way they organize the activities of this particular project, not just this particular conference, as I mentioned earlier. So I would like to take the opportunity, if you bear with me and join me in congratulating the RMIT University assets, right, which is the Accounting Information System Supply Chain Team led by Associate Professor Win Tai. Congratulations. And supported by Dr. David Thun, Dr. Zah Zahid Halim, Dr. Ashwini <coughs> Yalapali. I hope I pronounce your name correctly, Ashwini. Dr. Priya Prata Chauhuri, Dr. Rizwan Shumon. And from our counterpart in Busan, from Busan University Graduate School of International Studies, we have Professor Sun Yong Kim. I hope I pronounced the name correctly. And Assistant Professor Wum Mi Chang. Thank you, thank you. And congratulations. Now, this team of very, very capable researchers, academics, promise us that this is this particular conference is not the end, is not the end of the project. There are yet more things to come. So from what I understand, from what I understand is that there would be a skill training program to help build supply chain resilience research capabilities for both Australian and Korean university companies, sorry, companies. This space. Please watch this space. As I say, this particular conference is not the end of the project. So for this, I like to quote, that's why you see on my slide here from Sir Winston Churchill. It says, this is not the end. How true. It is not even the beginning of the end, but this, Perhaps it's the start, right? The end of the end of the beginning. So we look forward, we look forward to have more events, more activities coming through from <clears throat> these particular teams uh, of organizers from both RMIT as well as Busan National Universities. Of course, I cannot. I cannot close this event without 
saying a big thank you to all our speakers who unselfishly or generously share all their wisdoms, insights, research findings, experiences, and even simple observations as they pick up from day-to-day -day activities. So thank you very much to all the speakers, not just today's, perhaps to all the other events that have been held before this particular conference today. And of course, on behalf of the organizing teams, I would also like to thank all the panel chairs and moderators for their expertise, for providing very provocative questions, and for presenting right, their ideas as well, and giving this series of events that you have experienced here, some very, very engaging discussions. So thank you to all speakers, panel chairs, and moderators. And last but not least, are the participants. Without the participants, all these events would not be possible. And it is the participants who, can, who have kept alive, who have kept alive the events, who have made it so interesting, who have made the organizations of all these <clears throat> events, conferences, seminars, discussions, so meaningful and so insightful. So to our Koreans, to our Koreans friends, I will say, Gamsa Hamida. Thank you. Thank you to all the speakers, Thank panel chairs, moderators. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you Thank very you. much. Thank Gamsa you. Hamida and participants. Thank you all. Thank you. Gamsa Hamida. So, with that, with that, I would like to bring this event to a close and until we meet again. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you very much. Thank you. Back to you, Aswini. Thank you all. Thank you so much. Thanks a lot, boys. This thank you. Great thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Anmay. Thank, 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 thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Bui. Thank, thank you very much, Zin. Professor Kim. Thanks a lot. Thank and Hui thanks a lot as well. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. For, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for uh, the uh, support all. <laughs> Um, thank you. Thanks a lot, Hemi. Thanks a lot, thank Professor you. Kim. Thank you, thank Kim. You. Thanks, everyone. Thank you for a great concluding. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, everybody.